Hi, everyone. I'm Andy Nordgren. I'm at uh, Unity Technologies today, but that's uh, not really what I'm here to represent today. Before Unity, I was the senior producer and then executive producer for EVE Online, a uh, science fiction MMO. How many people are familiar with EVE Online? Space nerds, great. Uh, it's also my first time in Lithuania, really great visit so far. Unity has an office here in Vilnius and I've, I've spent two days there and it's been really great to meet the, the people here and I uh, look forward to coming back. But so, what I want to talk about today is some of the methods that I apply when thinking about designing for community. EVE Online is a game that is probably one of the games in the industry that's most driven really, really inside the game by community interactions and by participation from the players in the game. So there's not just a community around the game, the community is sort of inside the game. And we've learned a thing or two from, from that and what works in design and what doesn't work in design. And what I want to do is just share today a sort of perspective hack that I use myself, that we've used successfully on EVE Online, and that I also used in a number of other contexts for designing for community and interactions to happen explicitly. Not just designing your game and then hoping that community happens around it, but grab onto these interactions that you hope to happen and, and actually think through what might hinder them. We might call this a sort of interaction debugging, right? And the key here is that it's like a perspective shift. Uh, I find through, through my experience that a lot of discussions about game design, product design, they're centered on the game itself, the features that you want, and hopefully you have some user perspective or player perspective, so then you're thinking about the player with the game. And I find that very often this kind of focus produces... The, the right interactions can be more like an accident than intentionally designed. Because the focus on the game and the features sort of can obscure that what you actually want to happen is things between players. Right? And so what's an example of that? Let's take something from EVE Online. EVE Online has corporations, right? As makers of EVE Online, what is it that we really actually want to happen? If we stop thinking about, you know, what features should be in our corporation window, and we start thinking about out there, between players, what is it that actually needs to happen? Well, for example, we want a beginner to find a corporation to join. And so the method here, really, it's very simple, but again, the perspective shift is what matters. We put the beginner player on our whiteboard, it could be a real whiteboard or metal whiteboard, and we put the corporation or the corporation leadership on the whiteboard. And we say, what we want to happen here is for these to find each other. Now, this is an interaction. This is a social process. And what's very likely to happen is that there are a number of things that can block that from happening. So as a beginner, for example, I probably have all of these questions about, you know, what kind of corporation is this? Is everyone a super expert? Uh, what will they expect of me if I join the corporation? Is there anything, anyone like me in the corporation? You, there's, the beginner is going to sit with all of these questions. And on the corporation side, they're also going to sit with questions. They're going to go, is this a spy from our competing corporation that's trying to join as a beginner, uh, masquerading as a beginner? Security considerations are very real in EVE Online, uh, so that might very well be something that they're thinking about. But they might also think about, you know, is this someone who has any experience in the game at all? 
do we want, you know, are they going to be useless or are, we gonna, are they going to be able to contribute to our war effort, for example? All of these questions are things that might hinder that interaction from happening. And just the act of putting the actors on your whiteboard, the in, thinking about what interaction is it that I want to happen, and then debugging that, what might hinder it? It produces just very different design results or thoughts than what you are thinking if you're kind of starting in the features of your game. And it might also often bring you even outside your game. Because if instead of thinking about my features in my game, I think about this recruitment interaction, the joining corporation that we want to happen, I might say, why should this even happen inside the game? Why couldn't we help corporations recruit on the web by helping them describe what their corporation is like? And maybe the player can log in with their account on some website and join a corporation already there. Do they even need to download the game? Maybe finding and joining the corporation becomes the reason that they download the game because it sounds so cool to be in a crazy little ship and in some huge thousand person fight in even line, right? And so by focusing on the interaction that we want to happen, we sort of expand our canvas of solution ideas. And another very common thing, you know, relevant in EVE Online, but probably in your game as well if you're making one, is whether it's a multiplayer or a single player game, you probably want people to share or invite, right? It's another type of interaction, right? Who am I sending this to? Is it to a friend? Do they know me already? Would I send it to a stranger? What will they experience when they receive it? If it's a link, is there gonna be like a weird tutorial that pop up in their face? Or like, do I understand what they get when I send it to you? And then we have to understand that there's a social cost to sending something stupid to your friend, right? If you send a YouTube video and it's boring, you've sort of get, lost some credibility with your friend. Right? And if we don't understand that that's a, a potential, like if we don't have this debugging perspective, we might go, we have a sharing feature in our game. We want people to click the share button. And because we haven't looked up and, and thought about the interaction between the people, we might totally miss that before I'm gonna click share on anything to someone I know, where I'm putting my social reputation online, I want to see what it looks like. I'm not going to click send on some share email. You're going to spam my friend and I don't even know what you're going to send. And are you then going to like send them more stuff that I'm now responsible for them getting a bunch of spam emails, right? And these are types of ideas that come, again, when you're looking at those interactions. And to lift it out of EVE Online a little bit, this type of thinking, I, in a way, I apply it everywhere, right? Uh, another example is from SoundCloud, something that I was involved in working on in the very, very early days. And the absolute core of the SoundCloud design was informed by this type of thinking. Because really the, 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 the heart of how SoundCloud spun up was to facilitate a very particular interaction. And it was the one between someone who had a track probably in the pre-release stage, it's not finished, it doesn't have a label, it doesn't have album art, it's, it isn't necessarily a thing yet, or it's from an artist who hasn't like even made an album number of tracks yet, right? And we wanted to facilitate the particular interaction where you want to send that track to someone and you want to get feedback. And at the time, there were kind of two ways of doing that, or you know, you would use some like shady zip send file, something, something, right? You want to get an MP3 to someone, you'll use one of these ad backed services or, or whatever, because the file doesn't fit in email, right? Or if you put it on something like MySpace, it was going to be like one line of text in a player somewhere. It doesn't feel like, like an object. So if we wanted that 
interaction to be successful, we felt we needed to, it needed to be clear when someone sent the link, needed to be clear, what have I arrived on? And at the time, this is many years ago now, at the time, you had this for like pictures. Pictures then lived on a Flickr. You know, the photo had its URL, you arrived on the photo page. YouTube had this for videos. You know, you send a YouTube link, you're gonna land on a video page, and you understand I have arrived on the video page. And it was easy to predict, if you send such a link, what is gonna happen for the person who receives it, right? And there was no such thing for music. And so we did a couple of things to create that. And again, we were thinking about pre-release tracks, so no album art, no visual representation. And anyway, why is a picture a good representation for a piece of music, right? So we started generating the waveform for every track. This gave us a visual representation of the track that was big enough that when you linked to it, you felt like you landed on something, you had arrived at something. And then it also doubled to provide a way to talk about the track in detail. And so you could get meaningful feedback that went inside the track. Not just, I like the whole thing, but I can talk to you about the drop. And then the next person who comes there can see Without their even listening, they can see a huge spike of comments where the drop is in the, in the song, right? And again, you still have to have specific ideas for how to achieve what you want. I'm not saying that any of these features came out of just thinking about this particular interaction. But the key here is that once you start with the interaction that you want to see, you, start, you can start adapting your game or your invite system or whatever it is that you're trying to design. You can start adapting that to make sure, one, the interaction you want is not blocked in some obvious way. Because you have thought through, if you want, for example, like I keep talking about sharing actions because they are socially sensitive, right? Again, I'm putting social credibility on the line when sending something to someone else then one of the absolute first questions is this, can I preview it? Can I see what it's gonna look like to the other person? And you start to like identify obvious blockers, and once you've removed those, you can start to go, okay, how do we make this an awesome interaction? And you just start thinking different things. If someone, uh, you can also think about facilitation, for example. If you have these relationships or interactions in focus, you can start going like, if I'm gonna onboard players to my game, we knew this from EVE Online, for example, absolutely best retention for beginners is people who get onboarded by a friend. Makes sense, they have someone to teach them. EVE Online is a complicated game, right? So when you have someone to teach you that can just take you through all the early hoops and misunderstandings and problems and probably give you a ship with a fit that's already made up and that's gonna work for the mission that you're gonna go on, that's gonna go much better. And you can design for that to happen. You can make things that are specifically designed for the interaction to happen that the person who is ready to invite someone, why can't they give something to the person that they're inviting? Or why can't they decide where they begin in the game, for example? Okay, join through my link, and I have, because I've created it, I've set your starting system to mine out here in NullSec because I'm gonna teach you stuff over here, right? You're gonna bypass the normal tutorials because we know, and we allow that, because we know you have support, right? And we have designed for that to happen, not by accident, because you know this happens in reality anyway, but why don't we make it easier, right? And these are some of the types of things we start thinking about when we just, again, we put the hypothetical actors on the whiteboard, we think through what is it that we want to happen in reality, and are the circumstances possible for that? Is it gonna work, right? Or can we find obvious ways that this is essentially bugged or blocked? 
And I can tell you that almost every time we do this exercise from, from on something that started like in our thing, it should have these features, like, okay, here's what's gonna happen, here's what button we're gonna have in the game, and like, here's, here's how it's all gonna work, it's like kind of me, my thing, and then, like, oh, there's a user, right? They're gonna do like this, and blah, blah, blah. Things designed like that, when we apply the, okay, but what do you actually want to happen between the players, between the people, we find the bugs, okay? Uh, it's like a QA, uh, QA process in a way. And so this is the perspective that I wanted to place in your head today, because I think there's so many things that can benefit from this QA pass, right? I think many of you are making things that depend on other people to take initiative in some form for your thing to be successful. They need to be sharing the game, they need to be playing it, they need to band together inside the game, or at the very least, they need to tell a friend about the game. And have you debugged those interactions? Question number one, and question number two is, can you come up with design ideas that make those easier? And maybe some of those are inside your game, and maybe some of those are on your website, right next to your game, or maybe some of those are built into your, like your social media strategy, for example. So, I believe you can design explicitly for community by naming the actors that you are working with and the interactions that you hope that they will have, and then debugging. So, hopefully that's a useful idea to you. Uh, I hope you use it. If you do, tell me about it. You can probably find me on the internet. We love to hear stories. And uh, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. So, have a bunch of time for questions. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have a question? Okay, then let's start. And did you know cases when, how, I mean, I mean it's, is it possible to push too hard people to socialize? Oh, and, 100%. <laughs> because you're telling about how to make people like to talk to each other, let's say mm -hmm. help each other, but I think it's always should be rewarding, not punishing, mm -hmm. if you're not doing that. But what can go wrong in this case? Maybe you have some experience yeah. with that. Yeah. No, and it, it's when you fail, like again, it's when you fail to debug. If you try to push people to step into a situation where socially, for example, I don't know what, how things work here. If you don't know really how a situation works or like what you're gonna look like to your peers, or what's gonna happen? Are you gonna look stupid to other people? Then you're very likely to stay just passive. Or you might go, like, you might sniff that in a room, you know? Is this like a workshop and everyone has to participate? And you're like, no, thank you, I'm not even joining that one, right? And so people can, if you design things wrong, <laughs> you, people might self-select out of it from the beginning. Or you might, you know, like you say, you push people into it and then it just makes them bounce off. And that's where you really have to think about this. And again, this insight that interacting with others has risk. It has social risk. And very often your job as a maker or a designer of something is to reduce that social risk. It's like a design job. How do you make clever designs that in different ways remove the risk, annoyance, friction, because otherwise the thing that you're hoping to happen is just not gonna happen, right? You get the absence of action from people and then you get a flat community or a flat game and it's sort of right? Okay, so just make system as transparent as possible, I guess, mm -hmm. for the people. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we have a question here. Okay. Uh, how novice uh, could find someone who will teach uh, him or her? Uh, is it like uh, you found senior game designer on, on LinkedIn, I don't know, and all right, please teach me how to game design? <laughs> what do you mean, how I find people or how you would find people? What do you mean? If I want to learn game design, where 
or how I could find someone who will help me. <laughs> like you told uh, mm. that uh, uh, more senior levels uh, mm. could find uh, someone they will teach and mm. take to work to t into team. Yeah, so that is actually something that happens. I was talking about this inside, even online, the game. So this is what happens in, in corporations inside uh, the game, not necessarily out there in, in life. So I think in the, out there in life, it's a uh, school or uh, finding mentorship or community uh, and so on. And maybe you can also share a little bit of data with us. Uh, so not everyone would like to share their content in the game. And maybe you can tell, do you know what is some kind of edge level that it's good to reach for the game? Like 5% of people who's sharing screenshots or stuff like that, even for single game, or maybe more, so it makes really work by itself in the end. I mean, it's hard to talk about data like that. I mean, some of the data from, like super broad from EVE Online, for example, is more to recognize that when when people are onboarded by others, for example, like I said, the retention is like, I don't know, 10 times better or something. But then, like you say, it's not realistic that that's gonna happen for everyone. And so we were trying to move those numbers from maybe like 10% of beginners to kind of hold that steady or, or whatever, because that's where mo our most engaged players came from. So we had to facilitate for it to happen and we wanted more of it to happen but we could never count on that being the whole design. And that's gonna be a type of challenge that you're often sitting with. You want these interactions to happen, you want to make them easy, you want to design for them and facilitate them, but you also have to recognize that not everybody's gonna do it. It's like the power law of participation, right? Like most people are gonna read Wikipedia, and then you have a few nerds, a few awesome nerds who are gonna like, edit battle over some page about something, you know, for 10 years, right? And that's the same in whatever you're making. But again, with just these simple design perspectives, I think you can do much better but than luck and happenstance. Uh, again, if you're able to lift from kind of your game and your features, you can think also about some targets, like you say. How, how many is it realistic that will do this? And just like you can think about monetization, right? Okay, what's a conversion rate that's actually gonna exist in reality? It's the same to these sharing mechanisms, for example, right? What is realistic? And if that's realistic, what is it gonna do for our player numbers? And if we're gonna count on that, we better well have debugged and not just hope and prayed our way to that, oh, some people will share the game, hooray, right? Okay, thank you.